Welcome, everybody. Welcome to our session, officially coded S4, <laughs> Saturday morning for session, Building Digital Models to Navigate the 21st Century's Complex Ecological and Social Systems. My name is Chris Lubkman. I'm the head of the Strategic Foresight Hub at the ETH in Zurich. And it is truly a great pleasure for me to host this panel because it's something I'm not only personally very interested in, but also professionally very curious about what this potential has for us. And in contrast to what I usually do, I'm actually going to read a couple of things which have been written in preparation for this because they're so eloquently already done, I can't really improve upon them. So humanity created, captured, copied, and consumed more than 64 trillion gigabytes of data last year. I'm just trying, trying to imagine what that even looks like. 64 trillion gigabytes, it's a lot. This deluge of information is being used to try to model the world around us in unprecedented detail. I'm trying to think of all the models which we know. Realistic computer simulations as input to decision-making have the potential to guide better interventions, which is one of the reasons we're all here. Currently, several initiatives plan digital avatars and digital twins on the level of individuals, our humans in precision medicine, fuel the digital avatar of the human body, society, think about the digital urban, urban twins, trying to understand how cities are working, even buildings and cities and the planet with earth, earth observation and climate forecasting. What's intriguing and why it sits here with us today, this is going to require and requires an incredible trust between science and diplomacy communities. We heard this morning in the previous session about this tension between <clears throat> what we could do and nationalistic issues. This sort of came out of the table, the elephant in the room, when we're thinking of lessons of COVID. So where is this going to land us now when we look forward between science and diplomacy? The potential and value of database modeling approaches. So however, this is going to require a new multilateral governance approaches to manage the risks and avoid dual use, and for us truly to leverage the potential of us understanding what's happening around us. Going forward, these models will be increasingly intermeshed, creating sprawling socio-ecological simulations that can provide decision makers with invaluable foresight. And that's intriguing. We're going to hear a little bit here this morning now also about what can decision makers potentially do with these new models? Where do they stand? So many initiatives for digital twins have been recently launched. Question for us, to what extent will these initiatives be able to truly reproduce the complexity of our world? Right? None of us like to think that we're normal. But a model requires an understanding of a certain understanding of normal. How do you model it? All, right. All of us wake up, but how do you wake up? How many times do you turn the snooze button? Mm -hmm. Who has lemon in their hot water? Who has an espresso before they even move? All right? How do we start modeling these? Can we combine these models of the physical reality and <clears throat> the sociological realities? How reliable are these models? And how could we use them? So I could keep going on and on, but I'm not going to because you want to hear from the panel, not from me. And the panel is an amazing group of individuals. Right to my right is Neil Davis, director of University of California's Gump South Pacific Research Station in French Polynesia. So he came to yeah. us from French Polynesia. Then next to him is Mimi Mitsutori, Special Representative of the Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction, Head of the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction from Japan. Great to have you here. And next to her is Maurice Bourgon. Did I say that right? Right. Close <laughs> enough. Perfect. Yeah, all right, I'm trying. Yeah. <laughs> it's not always. Head of the Department of Science Application and Future Technologies, Directorate Earth Observation Programs in the ESA, Swiss, but based in Rome. Coming to us mm -hmm. today from Rome and last, not last, but not last in physical presence, but not in digital presence. We have Sean Cleary, 
Executive Vice Chair of the Future World Foundation, member of the Advisory Board, the Carnegie Artificial Intelligence Equity Initiative, Managing Director of lots of things. He just does lots of things. I don't know how he even sleeps anymore. But coming to us from South Africa, and last but not least, we have Dirk. Dirk Helbing, Helbing, excuse me, Dirk. Professor, Computational Science Department, Department of Humanities, Social and Political Sciences, and affiliate of the Computer Science Department of ETH in Zurich, coming to us from the Haupthalle in Zurich. So welcome, Dirk, and welcome to our panels. Give them a hand. Welcome, everybody. Great to have you here. So I'm going to start with a question to Mammy. You no, know, we are now in the Anthropocene. Humanity is impacting our planet in ways which she never imagined we would or she wanted. Um, what are some of the responses people have come up with? Is a digital twin going to be useful? How, how do you see this in your work? Oh, thank you, Chris. Um, we all have very long titles and mine is too long as well, but uh, I have disaster and risk twice in my title. Um, that's, <laughs> that's our business. Um, so, uh, Indeed, um, we human beings are now becoming the problem of, I wouldn't say everything, but most of the things in the world of disaster and risk that I work on, um, it is combined of three things, the hazard, the vulnerability, and the exposure, right? And um, before I go into this, uh, we run a campaign called No Such Thing as a Natural Disaster. Everybody talks about natural disaster, but disasters are not natural. Disasters come, uh, be triggered by a natural hazard, but it's us that makes a hazard a disaster because of our action or our inaction. And in terms of hazard, going back to the three elements, hazard, vulnerability, and exposure, hazards are broadly divided into natural hazards and man-made ones. Natural hazards, include earthquakes, tsunamis, these geophysical ones are, I think, natural. But when you come to extreme weather events, storms, floods, heat waves, are they really natural? We don't think so, right? We know that. Um, so we need to make sure that we mitigate the impact of the hazard first. But vulnerability, the next element is very important because as long as we have a lot of vulnerability in our society, in our economy, these become big risk drivers. These are poverty. These are people who are displaced. These are women and girls. Um, and these vulnerability in our society, we need to mitigate it. And if we don't, again, hazards become disaster. Exposure, the same thing. Our assets, our houses, our infrastructure, where do we build it? How do we build it, right? So there's a lot of space that we can do in order to avoid hazards from becoming disaster and here the models are extremely important because if we don't know the current situation, the baseline, as well as what happened historically and what will happen in the future, we won't have good policies to mitigate the risk. And I would think that good models that have the vulnerabilities, the exposure and the hazard element in it, past, future, and importantly, current, um, this will really help us understand better what, what are we living through and what can we do? And the other thing I would say is that the nature of risk that we are facing right now is systemic. We talk a lot about systemic risk because of COVID. One thing leads to another, public health crisis, now a social economic crisis. So the model has to reflect this. This is very complex, I know, but this is what we need because if we don't have a model that doesn't look at hazards or vulnerabilities in silos, but put them all together, mm. it won't work. And my last thing is resilience. We talk a lot about building resilience, mm. but do we know how to measure resilience? Mm. We don't have good enough matrix for resilience. Mm. That's why climate adaptation investment is not happening as it should. And here again, I want to see a model that have the matrix of resilience. I'll stop there, Chris. No, that's really interesting. So how are you using some models already yeah. well we work with insurance companies yeah. and we also uh, uh work with um you know organizations like geo um uh, for earth observation and whatnot but i think there's still a lot of um uh lack of of um data information around the things that i mentioned great 
Thank you very much. So, um, Maurice, European governments are supporting the development of ESA's digital twin Earth. I believe you're intimately involved with this, if I'm not mistaken, right? Indeed. Yep. <laughs> and um, you believe in what Mamie is talking about, of course. <laughs> well, there's no course. There's no course. Yeah. Yeah. And and so where where do you see um, the potential of the model? Where are we with this project? Tell us, you know, tell us your view on this. No, thanks for the question. Also, thanks for for being here. It's a great great opportunity here. Um, maybe let me just recall what we are talking about: these digital twins or digital replica of a system or of an object. I think. You know, it started not something new. Huh? We, we started, you know, to look at publications here. A very good example is what the, what was done in the industry here, uh, car industry here, where, you know, things were, uh, you know, uh, simulated here, how to produce to how to produce a car. But what makes or what is making the difference here, of course, it's, it's of course, a sheer amount of data, but the tools, the new tools that we have to, to assess this data, including AI, but there are much more about digital platforms and the machine learning and, 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 and the whatever. So at, at ESA, the, the European Space Agency, well, we launched the first satellite I think in 1977, but we really started to look at digital twins around maybe two years ago or end, end of 2018 here. And it's thanks, so it's a bit together with the, uh, the, the European commissions because we have developed a system which is called Copernicus. Uh, you know, which is an amazing system. It's six families of satellites here. It's fully operational. So the users, the scientists know that they have the data, not only for today, not only for tomorrow, but 10 years from now. So which is also something very, very useful, especially when you go to, to digital twins. And with this data, we are talking of what every six days, we have a global coverage of the Earth uh, at more or less 10 or 20 meters. It's not very, the very, very high uh, resolution, but it's enough for env environmental purposes. And I think, but still at 10 or 20 meters, we are talking uh, on a daily basis. It's, I think we produce more than 20 petabytes of data. Uh, you multiply by almost 365 days. It's 100 petabytes of data that you have uh, per year now. Quite a lot of information. So, so what do we do with this this information here? And it's you know we started as I said around 2018, 2019. Uh, we were looking at precursors of DTEs, and we were, we have some examples here for forestry or food systems here. What can be done here using using all this data? But I think what uh, brought at least in Europe all the things together is our initiative from the European Commission's the so-called Destiny Destiny E or Destination Earth here which you know we started together it's not only the commission it's not only ESA but it's also with UMETSAT the European Organization for Meteorological Satellite but also ECMWF the European Center for uh, Medium Weather Forecast mm -hmm. forecast and it's something interesting here because we'll come back to uh, to to digital twin so this um, this started in 2019 as I said 2020 and we are here at, at the start here destiny is is about to start we are looking at you know some other activities on, on our side called more a digital twin of the earth here uh, where we are maybe more looking at you know what could be done with satellites but also you know how to couple satellites with other type of data. And I think that's maybe one one of the topic here for for today. It's to me that the key issue is even you know the the amount of data that we have is tremendous. I think you know to process the data, I think we will have always a solution here, or very likely. But it's the diversity of the data here. We are not talking not same spatial resolution, not the same temporal resolutions here. The quality, can you? Are the data credible here? Can you trust on the on the data? The fact that some of the data we're looking at statistical data here, mm -hmm. which are not digitalized or, or things like that. So there, there are plenty of, of issues here. And, and and my last point here that I would like to say about in, in our initiatives here, it's not only to improve the models, but also to try to make simulation of what could happen in the, in, the, in the future. And uh, that's that's an interesting point, especially linked to, to the simulation, if they are credible, because then it goes to the uh, decision makers here and what you know the useful information. 
uh, let me just finish by giving this example, sea level rise, huh? you know, and you live in the middle of the Pacific here. Um, you know, it's, we have been monitoring this with uh, fancy uh, satellite altimeters, uh, measuring sub-millimeter uh, accuracy. It's, you know, the famous three millimeters a year, the sea level rise, huh? uniform. Huh? So over 10 years, since we are starting measuring in the 90s, here we are like at 10 centimeters here. Now, the key point, this is not uniform here. Some places, you, know, you have much more. And unfortunately for you, it's higher in the Pacific. <laughs> and, uh, you know, some of the places uh, you go to uh, on the, the shore of Canada, uh, of, uh, and also Alaska, it's linked to thermal expansions here, this sea level rise, and you have less. So it's not these, these uh, you know, uh, three millimeters a year here. But these predictions, okay, we can do this. It's, well, I wouldn't say it's easy, but we can do this three millimeters a year. We are talking with climate models. Are we talking towards, you know, at the end of, of the century to, I don't know, 50 centimeters, one meters? Uh, that's, that's, that's an issue here. But the also looking to the digital twins is what you do with this information here. Uh, going to the Netherlands, okay, does it mean they have to bring or to build this wall or increase the level of the dikes? Mm -hmm. Or south of France, you know, they were looking Camargue here, should they big, uh, build? And there, there are some, maybe some other solutions here, mm -hmm. you know, maybe to try to let the water in, to try to control a bit the, the water. Right. And that's the, the type of simulation that we can start doing with digital twins that we were not yeah. able to do. So and let's I'll finish with this. No, example. that's great. So this is a, so this past, present, future yeah. using some sort of past implications mm -hmm. to understand what's happening today. And as you're saying, for both of you, you're saying projecting out to the future to anticipate mm -hmm. both you know, these and the impacts, mm -hmm. and then to try out various scenarios mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. mitigation mm -hmm. of, the, of the inevitable. And um, Neil, you've just been mentioned mm -hmm. a couple of <laughs> times. I'm going under water. You're going under water. You're now sort of sinking <laughs> yeah. into the beautiful two waters. Um, but your project, you can tell us about just a minute, you've mm -hmm. been trying to understand on hand of, a, of an island, trying to model, mm -hmm. make a basically a digital twin of an island. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and trying to truly understand both the physical and the sociological interactions mm -hmm. in your modeling. Yeah. Yeah. So we've uh, actually it's just, first of all, it's great to be here in Geneva and I'm very grateful for the invitation from Jesda. And it's also very opportune because we, we started this project in, about eight years ago in, at ETH Zurich hmm. at a workshop hosted by Matthias Troyer, who I think is here. And uh, we launched, it was, and it's a scientific project, the focus was on the science to try to understand and build, we didn't call them digital twins back then, it was a, an island digital ecosystem avatar, so a digital representation of the island. Um, and the island in particular was Morea, an island just off the coast of Tahiti in French Polynesia, and also the neighboring atoll of Tetiroa. Uh, so how can we build a digital representation really from molecules to satellites, from genes to satellites? I'm a genomicist by, by training. So we're starting at the very, very mm. small scale and connecting it to all these data that are coming you know, from satellites. Uh, to actually, so bringing it, that was a scientific project. And today we're kind of launching into a second phase. Uh, so this is a, an opportune time, which really connects the science to society or tries to connect the science to, more to society and sort of re, renames uh, the, the initiative a little bit as, as now a sort of collective intelligence infrastructure for democratic ecological action. So hmm. collective intelligence idea. Um, so it's still an idea, but, and, and that change in name is significant. Maybe we'll expand on it a little bit later, but again, being here has been fantastic. I met Jeff Mulgan, who's one of the leaders, pioneers in collective intelligence com, uh, concept and, and Claudia Schwalitz, who was at the OECD has been pioneering uh, the deliberative democracy, and I think there's a very direct connection from what we've been doing uh, to those, which is which is why I think cool. it's exciting to move into the second phase. So tell us more about the modeling. So you yep. you, you start with the genome all the way up to the ecosystem. That's, That's correct. That's right. Yeah. So so the the goal is, is was to build, even though it was scientific, was to build a decision support tool hmm. for local governments. Hmm. And you know, and the why is, of course, we have these hmm. wicked problems of the Anthropocene and disaster resilience, unfortunately, is becoming more and more of a major issue. So how do we build climate resilient communities around the world? Uh, and how do we mitigate uh, the impacts that, that we as humans are having on our ecosystems and on ourselves? 
and we're bursting through the planetary boundaries right, at the global scale. And but we also need to advance. You know, we have a lot of poverty still and, and injustices that need to be advanced again at the global scale. And we've made some success. And I think you have to give uh, credit to the diplomats. Who, you know, we have at the global level at the UN. You know, we have treaties, conventions addressing climate change again. Uh, Biodiversity, the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, and we have a, a remarkable consensus globally about what we want to achieve through the Sustainable Development Goals. Which, so all of that is at the global level really quite impressive, and we we start to bring science in to inform those policies through the IPCC, which is which is a remarkable feat, um, and now IP, uh, the Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which is doing a similar thing for the CBD. So at the global scale, we're building this. Like, you know, sort of collective intelligence infrastructure and, and connecting science and diplomacy. But our interest was really at the very local scale. You know, we need to go much faster to implement that now. And that needs to be implemented from the bottom up as well as, well as from the top down. And so our focus was how do we help communities, local communities? You know, we happen to be on an island and there's some really good scientific reasons why we wanted to start there. But we need to address the overwhelming complexity of a social ecological system. Right. And all of the interactions between the microbes that you know we now know microbes of course make up most of us as humans and are, are super important for our personal health so we, we were very much inspired by the work from medicine mm -hmm. um, and approaches such as being called the p4 approach and personal uh, so these are personalized approaches every person is different you will have a different genome every place is also different mm -hmm. uh, a predictive approach um, we need to understand all of our diversity, but make predictive models about our future health state under different uh, scenarios in order to prevent the third P. This is Leroy Hood who, who developed this concept uh, to prevent outcomes so we can maximize wellness and not just treat sickness. Right. And the fourth P, which is a really significant one, is participatory <clears throat> because not only do we need to take some uh, agency in our own health, because if we're all going to monitor our own health, we need to take control of that to some extent. But also we need to share the, the data and what we learn about ourselves with others because we can learn from the misfortunes that might happen to others we can learn well i have that kind of genome too and if you had a bad reaction to that drug it's useful for me to know that because i might have the same genomic signature and that helps me so we try to apply that that uh sort of systems biology approach to social ecological systems cool. for, for the health of places people mm -hmm. and uh, natural systems that's cool Thank you. I want to come back to that in just a yeah, little, little bit. So we're going to we're going to jump into Sean. Sean, um, there are quite a few initiatives around the world. I know you did a an overview for Jazda, taking a look at quite a few of them, and it seems like there are more and more and more models, which makes it easier, <laughs> seemingly makes it easier for us to observe ourselves. Sure. I wish it were that easy. But, uh, <laughs> no. Go on. But, uh, you know, there's a wonderful notion that adding more voices to the debate doesn't necessarily improve the quality. It may and it may not. It just gets louder. <laughs> so let, let's just look at the sort of underlying drivers of what's happening here and then think it through. And, you know, everything that everyone has said already reflects elements of the drivers. But let me use as a point of departure this proposition that we're on the back end of a Holocene, which actually enabled the emergence of what we think of as advanced civilization. So advanced civilization over a period something of something like 10,000 years has enabled a remarkable series of human advances, social advances, economic and political advances, because humanity could thrive in the conditions of the earth system, the environment as it was then constituted. Yeah. As everyone has already said in different ways, this construct of an Anthropocene is the proposition that we are moving out of an area where environment affects humanity to an era where humanity is having a significant and possibly significantly deleterious effect on the environment, on yeah. the Earth system. And that's the challenge. Now, what we can see all around us in terms of everything from pandemics through 
wildfires in Siberia, to methane emissions, to extreme weather right across all parts of the globe, to the threat to island communities, demands a response. So humans, through their social institutions, have to respond to these particular challenges. Unfortunately, we can't experiment at scale in the real world. If we could, maybe we'd be able to solve some of these things, but the last 20 months of COVID suggests that we're not terribly good at that. We battle to play catch up when we're caught unawares by a crisis upon us. And the logic behind digital twins, the logic behind digital simulations, premised on whatever set of modeling tools we employ for that purpose, is potentially to give us anticipatory capability that enables better responses at different scales, enabling society at large, human society, national governments, multilateral institutions of different sorts to anticipate risk in the context of disaster associated with hazard and vulnerability and exposure in appropriate ways to work out what we ought to do about it. That's really all this is about. Digital twins are an experimental landscape within which we attempt to explore what may happen under particular conditions, alternative scenarios in that respect, what contribution humanity in different ways is making towards those particular problems, and what might be done through policy in order to address those challenges. So that's the logic of this discussion. Now there are huge limitations as is already apparent in terms of the descriptions that have been made, and Dirk, I know, will spell them out in significantly greater detail in a few moments. But that's the logic that we're dealing with. If I can move from the island to the 27 countries of the European Union just for a moment, perhaps one of the most remarkable attempts in this regard at the moment is Destin E, Destination Earth, which has been announced by the Commission of the European Union as an attempt to give substance to the European Union Green Deal, enable and leverage EU digital as a part of a strategy in order to be able to model the Earth system at large and humanity's interaction with it so that policy can be adapted in an appropriate way. Now, they're not completely mad. This is not unmitigated hubris. If you think about what Neil was saying about the challenges of doing this at the level of an island, then you will understand that doing it at the level of 27 countries, never mind 194, is obviously a gigantic piece mm. of hubris in a certain <laughs> sense. But it involves essentially using modeling from climate, modeling from weather enhanced by artificial intelligence, and then over a decade, theoretically, by continuously feeding back observation into the system, allowing for advanced machine learning on a continuing basis to improve the predictive capability, the scenario utility, and the policy impact of the systems. So that's all I'm going to say about it at the moment. I think the critical thing is not to imagine that anyone imagines that we're going to be able to model everything and then be able to draw definitive conclusions from it. But if we don't have a landscape within which we can experiment and explore, we're not likely to be able to anticipate and respond appropriately when we're caught unawares. Thank you, Sean. It's a really eloquent sort of summary. I saw everyone's heads on, on the panel are going, kind of <laughs> nodding with you as you were going through the description. And I think at the same time, um, there are also some potential challenges if we can model everything so wonderfully. I'm not so sure if I want someone to be able to look in my window and model me getting up in the morning or something. Right? There's some, there's some other sides to this which we also have to think about. I think, and Derek, you have been thinking a lot about the, the governance to ensure inclusiveness. This is something which is a very important is, issue for you, this issue of trust, acceptability, mm -hmm who's designing this, so we're not baking in the prejudices which we've seen in the past decade with some of the 
of facial recognition, voice recognition uh, tools. So tell us a little bit, what, what's your view on, on some of these? All right, so I have 12 statements on digital twins with me and um, digital twins are understood as detailed digital models of the world or parts of it. Number one on data, it's become an attractive idea to create digital twins of everything, including the earth, climate, and the human body. And while the benefits of this approach may be huge, it is also important to realize the limitations. For example, attempts to create an exact digital copy of the world are obstructed by biases, randomness, turbulence, chaos theory, quantum mechanics, and many other things. So um, we need to keep that in mind. All in all, we must realize that a data science rather than a data-driven approach is needed. Number two on complexity, creating an accurate digital twin for material structures which change little over time is easy. However, it will probably never be possible to produce an exact digital twin of life on Earth or of our body or of our health. And um, we need, therefore, to expect uncertainty. We need to have a complexity science approach on machine learning. The biggest modern machine learning models publicly known today try to learn a trillion parameters or so. However, sometimes simpler models have more predictive power and less data or even noisy data can be uh, generating better models sometimes. No matter, however, how many variables are being considered, there are many orders of magnitudes of interaction effects which are not captured, hence neglected, and this can produce a wrong picture and bad forecast, and that can be dangerous. On artificial intelligence, so far, big data has not made science obsolete, nor do we have a universal AI. And if we had one, this could still be dangerous. Suppose, for example, one would task an intelligent system to solve the sustainability problems of the planet. It might figure out that the easiest solution would be the population. It might trigger an apocalyptic scenario, even though a better future for everyone might exist. On optimization. The concept of optimizing the world is highly problematic because there is no science that could tell us what is the right goal function to choose. Should it be GDP per capita or sustainability, life expectancy, health or quality of life? The problem is that optimization tries to map the complexity of the entire world to a one-dimensional function. This leads to raw oversimplifications and to the neglection of secondary goals. And this is likely to cause other problems in the future. Using a co-evolutionary approach would probably be better than optimization and coordination approaches may be more successful than control approaches. On qualities, a largely data-driven society is expected to perform poorly with regard to hardly measurable qualities that we care about. This includes freedom, dignity, love, creativity, meaning, culture, in short, quality of life. On innovation, something like a digital crystal ball is unlikely to see disruptive innovations which are not included in the data of the past. Hence, predictions could be overly pessimistic and misleading. For example, consider the forecast of world population. According to some future projections, about one third of the world's population are claimed to be overpopulation. These people are in a danger of dying early of resource shortages. However, such projections do not sufficiently consider alternative forms of running our economy. Perhaps overpopulation is not the main problem, but the lack of economic reorganization is. Human versus things. <clears throat> in a highly networked complex world, where almost everything has side effects, <clears throat> feedback effects and cascading effects, ethical challenges abound. For example, people should not be managed like things. In times where many argue with trolley problems and lesser evils, if there's just a big enough disaster, problem or threat, any ethical principle or law might be overruled, including human rights and even the right to life. Such developments can end with crimes against humanity and that needs to be avoided. 
So that brings us to dual use. A powerful tool, particularly when applied on a global scale, may cause serious large scale damage. It is therefore necessary to map out undesired side effects of technologies and their use. Effective measures must be taken to prevent large scale accidents and dual use. Among others, this calls for decentralized data storage and distributed control. Moreover, transparency and accountability for the use of data and algorithms must be dramatically improved. On alternatives, we should carefully consider alternative uses of technology. I very much would like to push for the consideration of a socio-ecological finance system that would use the Internet of Things in a participatory way to locally measure externalities and provide feedbacks in such a way that this would promote the core evolution towards a circular economy and sharing economy. So this would be really oriented at change and action rather than just observation and prediction. On governance, as people are increasingly an integral part of social technical systems, a technological driven approach is not enough. We first and foremost need social innovation to unlock the benefits of the digital age for everyone. A platform supporting true informational self-determination is urgently needed. And rather than a war room approach, we need a peace room approach that supports an interdisciplinary, ethical, participatory, multi-perspective approach and a new multi-stakeholder approach. So in conclusion, smart societies cannot be operated like fully automated machines. And there's a strong imperative not to attempt it. When designed and operated without sufficient insight, digital twins may create a matrix world and technological totalitarianism. But when designed and operated well, digital models of the world uh, or certain aspects of it can offer a formidable policy instrument, not only for the management, of citizen societies, but also for the co-evolution of evidence and database information ecosystems that can foster a new collaborative relationship between citizens and policymakers. And that's what we're aiming for. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Dirk. I think I like the idea of uh, sort of being able through these modeling, especially to be able to internalize a lot of the externalities and to evolve to the circular economy, the more just economy, and you know, I think those are really, really, really great points. All, all of your points are really good. So I want to ask the panel, and you can ask questions too. If there's any questions in the room, I'm happy to take them. And um, also online, if you're in the Zoom, you can. And I neglected to let us know what the Slido is. And I think they can put the Slido up there. And you can, if you're more comfortable with Slido, I always forget that we can do this. I'm used to the good old hand holding thing. Um, but I do have a question. Does someone, Philip, you have a question? There's another question over here. So let me ask one question, and then the first question will be up here. How close are we to this goal of, of this interoperable model? Are we still siloed in 194 national efforts? Then we look at every academic effort. We've got thousands of them and research institutions. Are we getting there? Are we still, are we diverging, converging? Any views on that? Anyone? Neil, you keep shaking I could, your head. I, I so could you go. go you're, you're next to me, you know, you're the, you're yeah. the fall guy. I mean, we're not, in some ways we, we, we're already there. We already have some of these models, uh, some of these, if you want to call them twins, we have, you know, we, we make predictions about the climate and people are acting rightly in my view on some of those scientific predictions. So we have a model of the planet and we're using it and we're, we're not using it enough, but we, we, you know, it's there. So it exists at a global scale. Sometimes actually it's easier at a global scale than the local. And often we think, oh, it's, it must be really easy to do the small island rather than the big one. But actually for some of the questions, it's easier <laughs> that, that you lose the, the noise when you've got such a large area right, when you're in. The, so, so that's an important criterion. But, but also the, the, you know, we called it an avatar initially, just because that was the term we used, but we wouldn't have used twin for precisely this reason. You can't make a clone of living systems. You know, we didn't build living systems. They're far too complex for us to understand. We never will have a digital twin model. It's not a goal. We won't have one. What we'll have are multiple hypotheses 
which or many avatars, if you like, which might be even today what it is today. People will mm, disagree about it, let alone what yeah. it will be in the future. But 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 the last point I want to make, you know, it, it came up several times this time I mentioned democracy is because the people have to decide. You know, people have to be in the loop. It's a decision support tool. And that's what we've increasingly focused on support for whom and how. It's not a decision making tool. It could be a decision making tool for some industrial, you know, a car maybe. You want the car to make a decision quickly, but you don't drive a car by committee. But uh, when it, it, it's, it's questions you, you about. You haven't been in my car <laughs> yeah. with my it's Probably a disaster. <laughs> but, but questions that pertain to the common good who can define what the common good is? I think it's only the people who can do that. And there's great political science and work on. Right cognitive diversity and the democracy, democratic reasoning is, is a very powerful way of determining what the common good is, but it needs to be informed by science. We need to agree on the facts, and have some kind of structure that presents those facts to, to the people to decide. Just, just building on what um, uh, Neil mentioned, the problem is policy makers, decision makers are not following the science, right? Um, because if we, are, if we follow the science better, we not, we're not in this vicious cycle of disaster, response, recovery, disaster, blah, blah, right? Um, that's a problem that we have. But another problem we have, and I, it's about the digital divide, right? North, South. If you have good policymakers in the South who want to listen to the science, but they might not have capacity, they might not have funding. Um, so how do we overcome this? And if we don't, I mean, as a globe, we're not gonna do better because just one figure, last year, 10 million people were displaced by conflict. 30 million people were displaced by disaster. And mm -hmm. this is mm -hmm. now going to be the, the factor that's gonna grow and grow, and it's going to affect the global north. So from an anticipatory standpoint, this is a must from your, yeah. your standpoint. Absolutely. We need these, we need yeah. this desperately. Yeah. Maurice, you look like you're just wanting to- <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> How close are we? Uh, yeah. I don't think we are close. No. Uh, it's yeah. going to take quite, quite, quite some effort. But at least there is, you know, there, there's a willingness to go in that direction. So right. I think yeah. we have the data. We are getting more and more on the, on the models here. There are a few, a few, a few challenges here. But um, you know, I, I'd like to say that you know this was also alluded by some of the speakers here that it's to think, I would say, global, locally here, which is the, you know, this type of approach here that we need to, to do much more. In the, uh, the earlier session, there was things about decentralization here, about yeah. COVID, how to bring you know, this knowledge that you know, some countries or organization might yeah. have to the rest of the world. It's, it's, it's a key point here. And there is you know, a lot of effort still to be done in that direction. That's great to hear. Yeah. So I want to come, Philip, you had a question. You need a microphone up here. Let's get the microphone right to here, please. Good. Merci. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have a quick question uh, on having a digital twin or an avatar or multiple uh, mm. digital twins. Uh, this is a key question because when you're looking to the earth, when you're looking to the people, you're not talking about the, the same time scale. And uh, even from a technical point of view, I think it's very difficult to have a model that could integrate all the time scales. We move at a speed of a few kilometers when we were walking. The notion flows at a few millimeters a, a, a minute, uh, and you can have sudden crisis. You can have an, a, a volcanic eruption. So, so how can we envisage a model or models that could take into account these key elements, which is time scale. Great, fascinating question. Very correct. Let's put the mic back over to here, and then, then it, it, let's get the second question, and then we'll see. Oh, I'm uh, I'm Mark Rayner from Sun Courier Magazine. So it's a fantastic idea to use to, to use uh, what you call digital twins to anticipate. But if we're going to do that, don't we need to introduce into the public discourse this novel concept of an error bar? Uh, when you, when you really, well, some political speech, but an error these bar have uns, inherent mm -hmm. uncertainty in them, and surely we need to talk about that. How can we do that? The ra the range of errors. So here we got two questions. We're going to take those two time scales and the error bar. Who wants to pop? Who wants to answer that? And then we're going to take the gentleman in the back, then you, and then you. So go ahead. Who, so who wants to? 
They want to talk about time scales. How do we get the time scales from geologic to what I decided? Let, let, let me for take. Let, let me take a, a, a meta approach. Uh, the short answer, as as uh, Philip knows very well, is we can't. There isn't going to be a model that is going to be able to accommodate that level of time scale diversity at any point in the foreseeable future. It's not that it's inconceivable how one might tackle it, but it's not, I think, part of anyone's planning horizon under present circumstances. So my, my takeaway, and I'm not pretending uh, in-depth scientific knowledge on any level in respect of this, but my takeaway in respect of this is that one has to recognize that this is firstly work in progress. It is going to be, as all science inherently is, defined by falsifiability of the proposition, if I can use Karl Popper for the purpose. Hypotheses will be advanced, approaches will be put on the table, data will be fed back in, the systems will be educated to a certain degree by that additional data. And the systems, as long as they were reasonably well designed in the first instance, will broadly speaking improve. More than that, the idea that this can become a substitute for human judgment at scale is not, I think, with anyone's, within anyone's political planning at present. Clearly, you can postulate 1984 or Brave New World or a post-singularity universe. Clearly, you can postulate all of those types of things, but that's not what they've been developed for in the first instance. And as Dirk, I think, has made very clear, it would be utterly disastrous if we were to go down that particular path. Okay. So the limits of the modeling are what they are, and the political purpose behind them, I don't think, is to move down that path. Thank you, Sean. Neil? Uh, just yeah, on the well, the error bar, but also the time scales. But I think one thing is to have the data that are relevant to a decision. Having those data available globally, locally, in all the scales in between. You know, we're building that capacity, and we can then mobilize those data as and when needed to answer whatever the question is, which will be on different time scales right. and different spatial scales, depending on the question. So there will never be a model, because the model will right. depend on what the question is. But what we need, and that's why I talk about infrastructure, digital infrastructure, is, is we need to have access to those data as quickly as possible, interoperably. Then there are political and diplomatic issues about who has access to those data to do what with. And you know, might, it shouldn't just be wholly an open free-for-all where everyone can do anything they want with it necessarily. But the, so then you need to put in place the political or uh, diplomatic mechanisms, governance mechanisms for those data which will then, when I say data, we're also then including the models and the, the code and everything that gets used along with them. And just on the error bar, one of the most powerful things I think we've experienced is, is it, it demonstrates how much we don't know. You know, everyone focuses, oh, you're gonna be able to predict everything, but actually most people are shocked by, really, is that all you know? We're like supposed to be the advanced scientists <laughs> studying this place, and we don't know. And a lot of the response from local population is we knew that already. And you're just saying, repeating what we know, but in science, of course, it has to abstract things and, and then turn it into mechanistic understanding. So it's, yeah, we know that already, but we need to put it into these this different forms. We can turn it into a, a, a mechanistic model uh, and that has power beyond your own local experience. We can apply that to the new world because there is no, you know, we're going into an analog world where we don't, the past isn't really helpful <laughs> because we can't rely on our traditional knowledge or what we used to do. So, so the recognizing how limited our understanding is and we're making decisions, people are making decisions every day. This can help to show just how, 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 how much we need more understanding and how little understanding we're, we're bringing to bear on those decisions. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, another question back here. Yes, uh, Francois Gray from uh, University of Geneva. Uh, Chris, you started out with the word trust, mm -hmm. the importance of trust, and Dirk brought up the need to ramp up transparency around these models. And the question you know you raised just now, Neil, was uh, to what extent can we be totally open? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I wanted to hear from the panel about this issue of openness around these models. Mm -hmm. How open can we be? Could we envisage them to be as open as, say, the World Wide Web as becoming a, a standard that everyone can use and and uh, and build on? It's a very good question. And we take another question right here. The gentleman right here in the second row. And then, if you think about the openness. 
like the internet, the splinternet would have started to open now. So until recently, the arch example of a forecast system in the modern world were weather forecasts. I think it's a bad example because in weather issue until recently, there was nothing man-made. It was physical elements and uh, the human factor would uh, develop later. Do I go for a walk or not? Uh, it is not due to a lack of forecast system that World War I broke out just in the middle of Belle Epoque and that World War II just followed the creation of League of Nations. So we have a deeper problem there. Maybe there is a historian, Jacques Julia. He broke up with his family, the progressive leftist intellectual. He said, every time we have a problem, a disaster, there, there is a guilty one. And you all repeated that. All disasters are man-made, man even probably the Big Bang, which had as bad outcomes as myself. So uh, maybe, maybe it is not true. Maybe there are forces beyond human will, even the human will and thought of Nobel Prize winners. And maybe this is something we don't dare confronting, although it always blows up in our face in the form of a world war. So your question is? And concerning <laughs> climate, the all, all solutions have side okay. effects worse than the initial okay. problem. The nuclear, the uh, solar panels, the etc. We can list them all. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to take the interoperability, uh, sorry, the openness, the, the openness, the transparency, the trust. I'm looking at you, <laughs> Maurice. You've uh, we woven together the European uh, Union to create a model which is going to unify the Union in ways it's never been unified before. Exactly. Let's Beautiful. see if we have 27 yeah. member states behind, behind yeah. that. But I think the, the question is, is very relevant about, uh, you know, openness and, you know, to, to being transparent here. But, you know, I think here, uh, you know, quite a few here in the audience are maybe scientists or look, looking in that direction here. The fact of open science to me is, is key here. And if you want really to make progress in this field, you will have to share data, you have to share information here. I can tell you here that uh, I was talking about satellites here, the Copernicus uh, system. Since 2008, we have a full free and open data policy here. This completely changed the way that you know, people are using the data, that we are distributing the data. And I don't think there is anything, anything to share. No, I agree that's a lot of information, too much information might be, uh, might be you know, not always be productive, but let's make sure that all the information is available. And then you know, let's see how people will take advantage of this information or, or not. It's the same for models. I, I don't think you know, hiding you know, fancy models or whatever, uh, you are going to, to move forward here. The, 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 there is maybe one, uh, not saying bemol here, but the, the fact that in order to move forward in DTE here, it cannot be, it's, okay, for, it's from the science, public entities, but also there is a role for commercial activities here. And this will, you know, because, um, you know, large amount of funding will be, will be needed and all, all of this, and, you know, developing services here. So there, there might be also issues linked, you know, protecting some commercial interests here. But the basics in terms of, you know, being open, uh, transparentness, I think we should absolutely keep it. It's, it's a must, I think. Yeah, Thank you. A, a, no, I think it's a really, really great question, really great point. So, you know, it, it said change happens at the rate of trust. Yeah. And we know this, the systems, the way we make decisions now in many ways needs to change in some way. We need to react and to respond to the changes around us. So building that trust is going to be even more and more and more important as we see trust eroding in many, many. Question which came in online, which I think is actually quite intriguing, relating to um, should we aim for the synthesis of multiple sources of evidence instead of overly relying on a model because policy needs generalizable robust knowledge. And I'm just curious, but within, how do we respond to that? Because this is true. And is this, the question is, is overly re reviling, you know, either of you, Dirk, do you have a 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, um, I'd like to feed back on the questions that came in before. So first sure. of all, openness is really important because models need to be challenged, right? Um, this is how we make progress in science. However, we cannot expect there will be in the end one model that is the exact representation of a complex system, which is pretty different from what we're used to uh, from physics. So uh, when it comes to disaster prediction, for example, there is a pluralistic modeling approach that is, for example, used for tsunami prediction. So there are basically several models that make predictions. None of them will be exact. However, if you combine them, it will create a better outcome. So this is what we call collective intelligence in a sense. So having a plural, plural, pluralistic approach is actually beneficial. And uh, that's why we need communities of scientists that come up with competitive models that can then be combined. But altogether, yes, um, uncertainty will remain. And that basically means that we need to learn to be more flexible, adaptive, and responsive. That's part of what we need to build in terms of the participatory resilience capacity of our systems, right? So we shouldn't plan for systems that will not change over a long time. We, we should rather plan or design for systems that can flexibly adjust to the circumstances. Any other comments on that? You want to cross the panel here present? No. I mean, just some of the predictions or models will be, the certainty will be higher. So you can say, well, this is quite likely to happen. And these other things, you know, this is when intelligence, that this is quite likely, we're relatively sure about this. And then all of these are, are very uncertain. And so the transparency of that needs to be, but that also can help to highlight where new investment needs to be made in, in research or, or data collection, where we could reduce that uncertainty if we had these data or these new models or this new scientific understanding. And you, we could create then more of a pull for science from society. Saying we need to, you need to go out and narrow this a bit because we're not comfortable living with this level of uncertainty. Yeah. So maybe just, just one we're going to have to wrap up here very I soon. I want to... Just just one yeah. word. I think models are useful as long as there is a literacy um, in uh, the communities to translate that into policies, uh, unless uh, we can have fantastic models, but it won't work. So I think that literacy part is very important. And perhaps this is something which Jezda can also help with. Mm, exactly. Exactly that, that interface, that translation. And so the question here is in our last couple of minutes, we have two minutes left. What is Jezda doing and what can Jezda do? I'm looking at you, Sean, because <coughs> you're the, you and Dirk are the co-leaders of a task force can you, I'm going to give you the word for the sure. one minute. I'll do it very fast. The, the objective in respect of this is to create as a, as a point of departure. It's not a solution. It is a sine qua non. It's a necessity in order to be able to move forward. Something that constitutes, if you like, a JESDA observatory that allows for transparency, that allows for a capture of the initiatives that are being undertaken in this and related spaces. And that includes a much wider set of data and information coming from a variety of organizations, from the IMF through the UNDP and the World Health Organization, the WMO, and everyone else who feeds into the decisions that have to be made around this. The second element, that's simply observing. The second element, is to have some measure of oversight into this process itself. Because otherwise you can't build the trust. Otherwise you can't do the interrogation. Otherwise you can't clarify the issues that are at stake. And one approach to this is to have a science lens into this observatory, a policy lens into this observatory, and a public lens into this observatory to allow for large scale participation. And then the last element flows from that third lens which is to try to ensure citizen engagement. You can think of it perhaps in the context of a digital agora, the agora in 
very clear in Athens, as everyone knows, was where decisions were taken. We can enable that digitally today around these types of issues. We can ensure the transparency. We can enhance the trust and the understanding and potentially make a constructive contribution to the evolution of sensible policy. That's great. Thank you very much. And you and Dirk are co-task, you're co-leaders of the task force Correct. for JESTA. So if anyone here is in the room or online is interested in this initiative, please reach out to either Dirk or Sean, because this is something which I think in the JESTA community we feel very strongly is a very interesting opportunity to get right. Right, and we're now in the formation of this. So I think this is the opportunity. This has been really interesting for me. I wish we could carry on for another hour. <laughs> this is always a sign of a fascinating dialogue when there's still questions unanswered in the room. And um, I don't believe all of you are running away at this exact moment. You <laughs> please come up and ask the questions. But um, I, I really am fascinated by this idea of the past, present, and the future. Hazard, vulnerability. What was the last one? Exposure. An exposure. Right, to think about this in many, many different dimensions for us. And now P4, we have to come back with Neil to figure that one out, to actually <laughs> look at how we can expand at scale. And this has been great. So thank you for choosing to be here with us. And I wish all of you a safe and healthy rest of the day. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.